Okay, everybody. Hello there, and welcome to my video on training theory. Uh, we're just going to talk about some bits and pieces about how we train, how that has an effect on our body, and the implications that has for the way we want to train, and generally how we go about planning what we're going to do on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year basis. Uh, I'm a cyclist, so I'm going to be using cycling-based examples for some of this, but the things that I'm talking about are quite universal. Um, if you're not a cyclist, just apply this to your sport as well. Okay, so we're going to start out with the main point I want you to take away from this session. Okay, training is effort plus recovery. If you forget everything else I say, remember those five words because they're the key message of this. All right. Training is those two things. Okay, you can't have one without the other. Now, in a minute, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but it's worth really stressing this. If you're working out and you're not recovering properly, you're not training. Okay. Different thing. And if you're doing lots and lots of recovery on very little actual effort, that's not training either. Neither of those things is going to actually get you any better. We talk about the dose response theory of exercise. Now, the way this works, you get a dose of exercise, your body responds to that in a certain way, and if you're lucky and you've done things correctly, you'll be able to perform at a higher level thereafter, okay? We actually damage our bodies through exercise. We create little microscopic tears in the muscle fibers. We produce all sorts of unpleasant uh, byproducts, lactic acid, all sorts of things like that that do damage to us. When we stop exercising, what happens is our bodies start to rebuild and repair and undo all of that damage, okay? But they also assume that you are going to be doing that sort of thing in the future, okay? You do that work once, they assume you're going to do it again, okay? So they say, right, well, this time, instead of going back to where we were before, let's build this person a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, a little bit tougher, so that the next time we have to do this type of exercise, it's going to be a bit easier, okay? You go up to a higher level of performance, and that is what we call super compensation. You exercise, you recover, and you end up better than you were when you started. In this cyclical sort of damage and recovery, that over time is what makes you a better athlete. Okay, And you can start to see why it's important that we actually get both of those things right. If you imagine a big old clock, big old grandfather clock for swinging pendulum, okay, that swinging pendulum is what drives the clock. If you were to take that pendulum and just stick it on one side or the other without it being able to move in the opposite direction, your clock would simply stop. And the same is true in training. You've got to be able to swing from that exercise to that recovery and back to that exercise again. And it's that balancing act that allows us to get better as athletes. Okay. Now, an example of what that should look like in practice is this. Here we have a little graph of what it might look like if you're going to start training. Okay. So right at the start here, you can see we imagine on this dot here, we do a bit of training. Okay. We actually... After we've completed the training, we've lost a bit of performance. We're tired, we're fatigued. You asked us to suddenly do all that training over again. We might not be able to do it properly, okay? But then we rest, we recuperate, we recover. And with any luck, we end up at a higher level than we were when we started. So this blue line here represents the baseline. This is how fit you would be if you just didn't change what you're doing. If you just stayed on the sofa, you'd remain this fit. With training, although we're cycling up and down, we're getting more fit and less fit and more fit and less fit, over time, our trend is for us to get fitter, okay? The day-to-day -day variations are not as important when we start looking at it on the scale of weeks or months or years. What we're looking for is this overall trend upwards. So this actually, this, uh, I put weeks down the bottom, this probably wouldn't represent um, 20 or 25 weeks. This would, something like this, you'd maybe be looking at three, four, five weeks training. If you were talking about something over a longer term, you'd probably find it went up like this. And then the whole thing, all of these oscillations actually went down a bit. And then the whole thing started to go up again. So you'd get this up and down pattern on a bigger scale. And then even in the course of a year, 
you'll have some parts of the year where you're much fitter than others. You'll have some recovery bits where you tend to go down. You'll see this pattern within it, but you basically see this pattern repeated and repeated and repeated on a bigger scale over months and over years as you continue your training. Uh, and so that, you know, it cycles and cycles and cycles and cycles. Sometimes you've got to accept you're going to get a bit slower in order to get a bit faster again. But like I say, the key point is this balance between effort and recovery that puts us on this nice upward trend. The reality is it's not going to look like this. Um, some of these peaks are going to be much higher. Some of these troughs are going to be much deeper. Your overall trend line is not going to be straight. It's going to weave up and down. It's going to do all sorts of things because real life has this unfortunate habit of getting in the way. OK, training is a messy process, but overall averaging stuff out. This is what we want to achieve. Now we're going to look at some of the ways it can go a little bit wrong when you don't pay enough attention to the balance between the training and the recovery. This is our first example, overtraining. This is what you get when you're doing perhaps the right amount of effort, but you're not getting enough recovery. So you can see here that actually we might see a little bit of a bump in performance initially, but ultimately because we're not recovering, our trend, instead of being straight or upwards, which is what we want, our trend goes downwards like this. And that's OK to do for, you know, a couple of weeks. We talk a bit more about that later on. But if you're doing this long term, if you're doing this in the months, then it can lead to some really serious physical consequences. Low energy, depressed immune system, low bone density, osteoporosis, frequent injury. And you're going to feel terrible and you're not going to be going very quickly or doing very well in your sport. So it's something we really want to fight. And it's why a lot of coaches take this less is more approach. Something that we talk about a lot in coaching is you do the bare minimum of training that will bring continual improvement. And a big part of the reason for that is because we want to avoid this overtraining problem. OK, it's very easy to fall into this trap. Um, just a little note down here. Women can be slightly more prone to this than men, depending on the type of training you're doing. Um, the menstrual cycle has quite a big impact on it uh, in the later phases of your cycle. So going towards the end of it, it's slightly more difficult for women to recover and it's slightly more difficult for them to have training benefit. Um, it's actually easier for women to train in the first half of their cycle than the second, because in the second half of the cycle, you've had ovulation and your body is kind of saying, well, I'm ready to have a baby. I'm ready to be pregnant. And it's kind of holding back on its energy reserves. It's holding back on its ability to do things not related to that. Whereas once you sort of start your cycle, that's it. It's all gone away. No chance of pregnancy. And your body can use those little bits of energy it was saving in order to help you recover and help you train more effectively. So I've gone off on a little bit of a tangent just there, but it's relevant. It's a good thing to know about. Now, our next thing we can get wrong. We've had overtraining. We've had correct training. This is undertraining. And this is what you see quite often with a certain type of club cyclist or club, you know, sports club participant who maybe goes and who does quite a big bit of training on Saturday or Sunday, but doesn't really do anything during the week. So you get this big bout of training here, this big bit of damage, you get this nice big recovery spike. But then because they don't do anything during the week to maintain it, by the time the weekend rolls around again, they've just reverted back to their baseline. A much better solution for an athlete who's suffering from this problem, we can see, well, where's it starting to go down? Maybe Wednesday, we just want to do a little bit, wouldn't have to be much, just enough to arrest the slide, bring us up a little bit more, take us up maybe to around here somewhere. And then when the weekend comes around, we've just, we're at that slightly higher level. And if we then train again, we're going to start to see some improvements. Okay. It actually does take a while for you to lose all the benefits from even quite a short session, um, you know, seven to 10 days maybe to lose everything. So you don't need to be super stressed about undertraining. Um, the vast majority of people can actually, you know, get by on and still keep improving on not very much training at all, as long as they are doing that training correctly. A colleague of mine told me once about a person he was coaching who was very, very ill. 
and was only able to actually do, I think it was half an hour of training a week. Might, it might have been even less than that. Um, and my colleague who was coaching this athlete was surprised to find that this person was still able to make improvements, even only on half an hour of structured training a week. So it is possible. Um, in terms of issues you could be facing, under training is probably not going to be your biggest one, but it does have the potential to be there. Okay. Now, under training, over training, training in the middle, you might think that those are all of our options. Well, not quite, because there is a fourth thing it's worth talking about, and that is overreaching, which I've called training camp syndrome here, although I could equally well have called this school holiday syndrome uh, for reasons I'm going to talk about in a minute. Now, the idea here is that over the course of a week, 10 days, however long your camp is, you go a long way into the hole. We do a lot of training. We don't fully recover. We keep on going. And then after a week or so, we come home from our training camp and we have a nice rest. Because we've gone further into this damage, further into this hole, further into this fatigued straight than we normally would, if we then rest and recuperate, there is a chance that we can rebound to a much higher level than we normally would. So a week afterwards, you may well be absolutely flying. Now, the catch here is that it starts to become difficult because it is easy for overreaching to bleed into overtraining. There's no clear, defined, distinct line. If you do too much training in too short a space of time, it's possible that you'll end up in a situation where it's going to take you so long to recover that you're just going to lose all of those gains. So people who do something like parry breast parry, which is a 1200 kilometer um, bike ride that you do all in one, or the transcontinental race where you race four or 5,000 kilometers right the way across Europe, that type of effort puts such an enormous strain on your body that whilst in theory, you can recover from it to a higher level. In practice, it takes you so long, so many weeks or months to fully recover from something like that, that you just lose all your gains by the time you've actually recovered. So it's definitely possible to go too far in terms of overreaching, but you know, doing a few consecutive back-to-back -back days and then making sure you get some good quality rest afterwards can definitely be beneficial. And the reason I talked about it as school holiday syndrome is because it's something that a lot of um, kids who are hoping to perform at a decent level will do over the school holidays. Their coaches will give them quite a hard program for half term or for Easter or whatever it may be. Um, so that when they're not having to do their school work and deal with all of that, they can just spend a lot of time training. Then when they go back to school after the holidays, they'll be quite tired and quite fatigued. So they'll just have it you know, really couple of really easy weeks to, to allow them to rebound up to a higher level. It's a good way of sort of managing that um, pattern of work that school kids tend to have. So this brings me on to talk about ATL and CTL, which are acute training load and chronic training load. Okay. ATL, acute training load, that is the training you do over the course of one, two, maybe up to three weeks. So in terms of overreaching, it's OK for it to be, you know, quite heavy or unsustainably heavy for two weeks, maybe three weeks at the very, very top end. OK, um, once it starts getting more than that, if you've got a month, if you've got over a month, then you're getting into territory where it's going to be whatever it is you're doing. It's going to be really, really tough to recover from that. And you're going to start seeing some medical side effects that you really don't want to have to deal with. OK, so. ATL and CTL are things that we try and track in terms of um, maintaining your overall, the correct amount of training. Okay, so it's fine for ATL to be very high. You probably don't want your CTL to be higher than you can manage because that's, you know, that's what's going to lead you into trouble. And talking of that, now we're going to move on and we're going to have a little look at how we tell how much training is enough and how much training is too much. Okay, there are a few options we've got here. Um, the big takeaway message is the simple ways still work, but there are more modern, more advanced ways that in certain circumstances can maybe tell you a little bit more. Okay, the simple method of doing it is 
track your resting heart rate for about a week when you're in you know quite a rested state and the best time to do this is quite early in the morning just after you've woken up you're lying in bed have a little check of your heart rate and just see what that is and plot that out do it seven eight days work out an average okay if you're in an overtrained state, if you've been doing too much, you'll find that your resting heart rate is quite elevated. It'll be up by maybe more than five or six beats. And at that point, you should be saying to yourself, OK, I've been doing a lot. And if you don't have any rest days scheduled in, that's when you maybe need to reevaluate your training and take a bit of a break. Um, if your heart rate's up by five or six beats and you've got maybe one or two more days of heavy training and then a rest, that's probably fine. You can tolerate that. That's just going to take us into a little bit of overtraining. So you've just got to make sure you have a nice long rest afterwards. In terms of more modern stuff, you've got programs like Training Peaks. Um, this is one of the big programs that's used by a lot of coaches all around the world. Um, it's, it works a bit better for endurance athletes than it does for sprint athletes. Uh, because sprint is so short and intense, it's quite difficult sometimes to get a good indicator of the effect that has on the body. <coughs> but the thing about a program like that is that it is a model. And a model is only as good as the inputs you give it. So if you want it to be really reliable, you're going to have to go down the route of inputting all the details of everything you do. You're going to have to be quite meticulous about tracking your training and tracking your heart rate and tracking your numbers and doing really frequent tests um, to make sure that all the data you're feeding it is accurate. Um, some people love all that sort of thing. Some people love all the metrics you can get from that. Other people don't necessarily want to go down that route. A little thing that's somewhere in the middle um, is the information you can get from smartwatches and whoop straps and general sort of fitness wearables. <coughs> A lot of these will have algorithmic methods of telling you um, how much training load you've had based on things like your sleep patterns and your um, heart rate variability scores and uh, respiration rates and so on. And they'll give you an indication, you know, in quite a simple and easy um, way to look at whether or not you should keep training. HRV, your heart rate variability. I'm just going to touch on this a little bit because this is a really interesting thing that's come up in the last few years and it's now available on a lot of um, devices like Garmin sports watches and so on will tell you this, um, various other methods of, of finding it as well. Basically, when the human heart beats, it doesn't beat like a metronome under normal circumstances. So instead of going boom, 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 it maybe goes boom, 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 boom. There's quite a lot of variability between the beats. And that's a good thing. That's what you want. Um, if you're healthy, if you're rested, if you're fit, you want a relatively high heart rate variability. But when you're uh, really fatigued and you're really, um, or if you're ill or if you haven't been sleeping, your heart rate variability goes right down and it turns into that kind of metronomic boom, 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 boom pattern. Um, so this is really interesting because this is a sort of really quantifiable way where you can actually look at a metric and you can count it and you can go, that tells me exactly how much training load I have had. Now, as with all these things, it's not perfect. It's susceptible to some of the things I've mentioned earlier, things like lack of sleep, things like external stresses, things like falling ill. But nonetheless, it's probably one of the best tools out there at the moment in terms of measuring your sort of real time ability to accept more training. In cycle specific terms, we've got the LSC test, LSCT test, sorry, I knew I was going to do that. Um, that's a kind of easy ramp test. And what that does, that has you ride at three percentages of your maximum heart rate. It's something like 60%, 70%, 90%. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but the idea is you ride at those percentages and then you say, um, what are my power numbers? If you've got a power meter, uh, are they higher than they usually would be? Are they lower than they usually would be? Or if you don't have a power meter, you say, uh, well, how does this feel? Does this feel harder than normal? Does this feel easier than normal? And it's quite a good little test because you could just use it as a warm up. Um, it would be quite an effective warm up um, before a main session. And it's a good way of telling you um, roughly how you're feeling 
in that session. Are you feeling good? Are you feeling bad? Are you rested? Are you not? Uh, and if you do it on the same day of the week and under similar conditions, you can track your progress over time. So it's a good idea, whatever your sport is, to have a little something like that that you can build into your training and just do it once a week, once every couple of weeks to give yourself a sort of rolling idea of what your fitness is doing. So come on to our conclusions. Training is exercise and recovery. It's the pendulum that swings that powers the grandfather clock, okay? You stick that pendulum to one side or the other, it's simply not gonna work. It's also a complicated, messy process. It's not a linear sort of straight line towards progress. You're gonna be um, lower performance, you're gonna be higher performance um, from one session to the other. Some days you'll feel fantastic, some days you'll feel awful. It's not just gonna be a straight progress forwards. What we're looking for is an overall trend upwards okay over the course of months or years you should be gradually getting better but from one session to the next you can't really necessarily draw too many conclusions from that and the last thing track your recovery in the same way you track your training okay most people if they're seriously into training they'll have some method of recording it it'll be on their phone it'll be on an excel spreadsheet it'll be on some third party app something like that if you really want to see performance gains, do the same for your recovery, okay? Are you resting enough? Are you getting enough food? Are you getting enough sleep? Um, are you having enough time between sessions? That's something we're gonna talk about in more detail in my next video, which is gonna be out next week. So if you wanna know a bit more about that, feel free to tune in then. For now, I hope this has been at least uh, a little bit of help. Bye for now.